My name is Father Roger Landry, and it's a joy for me to be with you tonight as we enter into this virtual conference called Questioning Faith, Questioning Church. I'm grateful to Father Leo Padalinghag and all those at Plating Grace for their kind invitation to participate in this conference. Plating Grace does such great work in stoking the hunger of so many of us to receive the nourishment God wants to give us in all the ways he seeks to feed us. Father Leo Padalinghag, I'm honored to say, was a seminary classmate of mine at the North American College in Rome, and I'm so proud of the work that he's doing. Today, our topic is responding to hypocrisy and scandals in the church, which is a very relevant issue because so many today leave the church precisely because of hypocrisy and scandal. This is common in every age cohort, but it's a particular issue with those who are now being called by sociologists, the nuns, the young people who say none of the above when they're asked what religion they believe or they practice. And so to be able to respond to scandals and hypocrisy, one of the most important aspects of our duty to be apostles to the people today. And so I'm honored to have been asked to present on this very challenging topic. In order to be able to do so more effectively, I'd like to share my screen with you. Since the onset of the pandemic with all of these conferences that have taken place online, I have found that at least for me and for visual learners like me, it's so much easier to have something to look at than look at a talking head for a half hour. And so please permit me now to share my screen with you. And you'll see in the first slide that we pick up a, si a slide of Jesus in Judas. We see right from the heart of the gospel that Jesus himself suffered betrayal and scandal. He himself had an, a huge hypocrite among his original 12 disciples who would use an act of love, a kiss, precisely to turn over the one who would die for him. We see that kiss blistering Jesus' face here in the gospel. Jesus permitted that to occur because he knew he was going to bring even greater good out of that hypocrisy and betrayal. Jesus always wants to bring far greater good out of the evils that are permitted. He never wants evil. He never wants scandal. He never wants hypocrites and hypocrisy. But he permits them willing to bring out greater good. The conversions of the hypocrites, the forgiveness of others who have been betrayed, the many ways by which God seeks to sculpt us to be more like him who is the one betrayed the most. The Fathers of the Second Vatican Council in 1965 and the Pastoral Constitution of the Church in the Modern World called Gaudium and Spes, meaning in Latin, joy and hope, said that the problem of atheism likewise flows from hypocrisy and scandal. Listen to these powerful words. Taken as a whole, atheism is not a spontaneous development, but stems from a variety of causes, including a critical reaction against religious beliefs, and in some places against the Christian religion in particular. Hence, believers can have more than a little to do with the birth of atheism. To the extent that they neglect their own training in the faith or teach erroneous doctrine or are deficient in their religious, moral, or social life, they must be said to conceal rather than reveal the authentic face of God in religion. So many people can be driven away from the faith by the way believers fail to live up to what we profess we believe. It's good and legitimate, we have to say at the beginning, to hold Christians to a high standard. We Christians are called to believe what Jesus taught and put that teaching into practice. We're called ultimately to love others as Christ, God incarnate, has loved us first. And when we don't do that, people have a reason to think that our faith isn't true. We're supposed to forgive when we don't. People are turned away. We're supposed to keep the commandments, to honor parents, not to hate or take life, not to lie, not to steal, not to be envious. Whenever we do these things and break the commandments, we cause scandal. We're supposed to live the Beatitudes, be poor in spirit, be meek, be peacemaking, be pure of heart, hunger and thirst for holiness, be willing to suffer for the one who suffered for us. And when we don't, it stands out. 
We're supposed to care for the poor, the neediest, the least. And when we fail to do it, people are right to take offense. Whenever we do not live the gospel, we give scandal and become what a scandal is, literally a stumbling block for people. And we often prevent their following Christ in the path of faith. Scandal can turn away first the good. One of the most classic examples is Mahatma Gandhi. A Christian missionary once asked this 20th century liberator of India, Mr. Gandhi, though you quote the words of Christ often, why is it that you appear adamantly to reject becoming his follower? And Gandhi replied, oh, I don't reject Christ. I love Christ. It's just that so many of you Christians are so unlike Christ. Christians would really live according to the teaching of Christ as found in the Bible. All of India would be Christian today. We could extrapolate well beyond India. Christians really lived with the love that beats in Christ's heart. The whole world would be Christian, but only two of seven are. And of those two of seven in the world, many profess it publicly and are in paper, but not in deed. Scandal turns away the good, those of good conscience who would otherwise become Christian if only we reflected more the love and the light of Christ. But scandal can likewise calcify the evil. The most famous example of this that I can cite is Friedrich Nietzsche, the 19th century German philosopher who coined the phrase, God is dead, and if he weren't dead, would have to kill him, and whose thoughts were one of the main lines that led to Nazism. He said something far more severe than Gandhi. He said, I may have been able to redeem, uh, believe in a redeemer if I had ever met someone redeemed. But we can't necessarily trust everything that Friedrich Nietzsche says. The guy was mad. But he could have been telling the truth. If he had met somebody like Christ, human history may have been different. But instead, he found so many who were like following the herd, not authentic people not those who had chosen to believe in Christ and could defend it, but by so many easy followers of worldly ways who Nietzsche thought were Christians for the sole reason their parents were Christians and their grandparents were Christians, not because they had ever made a choice that this was true. They didn't behave as if they were redeemed. They weren't living with gratitude. They weren't paying that redemptive love forward, and it turned Nietzsche away. There's a built-in contradiction of scandals, this disconnect between what one professes and how one lives. And we call this hypocrisy. Hypocrite comes from the Greek word for actor, someone who literally in Greek wears a mask. With hypocrites, what you see is what you don't get, what is not what you get. They break down trust. You can't believe what they say. You can't follow their example. You basically can't stand the pretension that they're good when they're not. You see on the left, various of these ancient Greek masks, the actors in a comedy or a tragedy would change character on the fly and just put on a different mask. And that's what a hypocrite always does. We pretend. And when people have those pretensions exposed, others are turned away. This is obviously a problem with the clergy sex abuse scandal. On the left, you see the former Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, who was a hypocrite, who didn't practice what the church professes with regard to sexual morality, who often protected many others who weren't practicing the faith either. So many priests who were supposed to lay down their lives for Jesus' people instead took advantage of them, including the most innocent of children. Many bishops who were supposed to supervise and protect Jesus' flock from the wolves didn't eliminate the wolves, but just shifted wolves from one place to another. Rather than caring for victims, they often stonewalled them or didn't treat them as beloved children of God. Rather than telling the truth, they lied about it, often to protect the church's assets or reputation, prioritizing that above protecting the very children Christ had entrusted to them. Such filth made it hard for people to believe in the holiness of the church made it hard to, for them to believe that the bishops were successors of the apostles, those men who laid down their life for Christ and for his church and his flock, made it hard for them to believe in the beauty of chaste celibacy. When they saw so much perversion, they thought that it had to come from 
chase celibacy rather than from sin and from the temptations of the evil one consented to. Jesus, of course, was a chaste celibate. Mary and Joseph didn't live out their love for each other genitally. They themselves were perpetually continent. So many of the greatest saints who have ever lived were chaste continent. It doesn't come from chastity or continence or celibacy. It comes from sin. But many people have jumped to that confusion precisely because of the scandal of the sexual abuse crisis. Many were scandalized away from the church's sacraments, the Eucharist celebrated by men who had been abusers, not to mention the sacrament confession in which people who are really notorious sinners were sitting in a place in which for the Lord, they were absolving the sins of others. People just couldn't stand it. They couldn't stand to think about it. It scandalized them. But there's a much larger problem with hypocrisy in the church, something that extends beyond the fallen clergy and religious. Christ calls all his followers to holiness. And there's such a lack of holiness in the church, such a lack of love for God and others shown in so many ways in the majority. How can those to whom Jesus says, whatever you did to the least of my brothers, you did to me, treat the poor, the elderly, the unborn, the broken, the disabled, with hardness of heart rather than love. How can three out of four Catholics not come to Mass when we proclaim that, Jesus, that the Mass is Jesus' body and blood, that it's no longer bread and wine at all, but God himself? How can we put Sunday talk shows or even cartoons or golf above God? How can we prioritize so many stupid things over making time to pray? How can so few Catholics really know sacred scripture when we proclaim that sacred scripture is the word of God? How can we delay baptizing babies when we know that baptism is necessary for salvation? How can we not admit we're sinners and come to receive God's mercy in the sacrament Jesus himself established on Easter Sunday night? We're the biggest of hypocrites if we try to pretend that we're the immaculate con conception, that we, like Mary, have never sinned. We need God's forgiveness. How can so many Catholic marriages cavalierly break down and Catholics divorce and remarry, even though Jesus, Jesus himself, clearly teaches that divorce and remarriage is adultery? The problem of hypocrisy and scandal is enormous in the church. Jesus spoke out a lot about hypocrisy himself. I'm going to give you a list of things that he said. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but don't do as I say? He publicly challenged those who are listening to him. He reminded that nothing's concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. We really can't have a secret life. It's all going to come to the surface. He said Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Our hearts and our lips have got to be united with the Lord. He said, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs. We see some whitewashed sepulchers on the left, which look beautiful on the outside, but in the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. On the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. He said elsewhere, beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted with respect to the marketplace and have the most important seats in synagogues and place of honor at banquets. But they devour widows' houses and sh make a show of lengthy prayers. He tells us that they'll be punished most severely. The hypocrites and scandalizers never get away with it. If they don't repent, they'll go to hell. He summons us every Ash Wednesday to look to make sure we're doing things sincerely rather than for show when we pray, when we fast, when we give alms. I'll focus just on what he says with regard to fasting. When you fast, don't look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces and show others they're fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. When you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you're fasting, but only to your father who is secret, and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. We do things in communion with God, not for show. We finish with a saying from the Sermon on the Mount. 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? They did all of these things. But Jesus says he'll tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you hypocrites, you evildoers. Hypocrites, by Jesus' powerful name, can even sometimes work miracles. Priests, for example, who are hypocrites, work the greatest miracles of all in the sacraments. But they never really know Jesus. Like Judas never knew Jesus. He didn't know his mercy. He didn't know the depth of his love. He didn't know his passion to love others rather than betray them. And so Jesus will make sure one day that what they faked here on earth won't be eternal. And it will be known to everybody else that they never had a personal relationship with Jesus. Jesus himself suffered from hypocrisy. We know that so many were conspiring to kill Jesus, including arch enemy, the scribes and the Pharisees on the one hand, the lax as Sadducees and Herodians on the other. They would come and flatter Jesus. We know that you're a teacher who's come from God, who teach what is only in the truth. So tell us. And then they try to trap him. And behind his back, they were plotting to get him murdered. We can't forget, as we've talked about earlier, that he was betrayed by one of his own, Judas, who sold him out with an act of love, as we can see in the image on the screen. But Jesus knew these betrayals were going to happen. He announced it, saying, surely one of you will betray me. And he didn't stop. He kept going forward. Why? That's a great lesson that he taught us with some of the parables in Matthew 13, in which he says that in the church he's founded, he's going to have both good and bad. And he wants to work that great miracle of turning the bad good. First parable is the wheats, weeds in the wheat. It says the kingdom of heaven may be likened to a man who sowed good seed in his field. While everyone was asleep, his enemy came and sowed weeds through the wheat, and they went off. When the crop grew and bore fruit, the weeds likewise appeared. The slaveholders, sorry, the slaves of the householder came to, G, came to the master and said, do you want us to go out and pull up the weeds? And he replied, no, if you pull up the weeds, you might uproot the wheat along with them. Let them grow until harvest. Then at harvest time, I'll say to the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles for burning but gather the wheat into my barn. So often we can be so focused on uprooting all the weeds, all the scandals, all the hypocrites. But Jesus wants us to focus rather on being good wheat, on bearing real fruit. If we're really bearing acts of love, if we're capable even of the love of martyrdom, the good that will come from one saint is greater than the evil that will come from one scandalizer or hypocrite. And Jesus wants us to focus far more on that wheat. He likewise gave us a parable of a dragnet dragging in fish of every kind. So the kingdom of heaven is like a net thrown into the sea, which collects fish of every kind. When it's full, they haul it ashore and sit down to put what is good into buckets. What is bad, they throw away. Thus will it be at the end of the age. If somebody ceased going out to catch fish because in every net there are going to be bad fish, people would starve to death. Jesus wanted us to cast the net into the deep, recognizing that occasionally some people aren't going to prove to be good. But he wanted us to still fish for people because so many, in fact, will be good. Jesus spoke out about scandal. He said, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone hung around his neck be thrown into the depths of the sea. You can see a huge millstone over on the left. Imagine getting that around your neck and thrown into the Pacific or the Atlantic. He said, woe to the world because of things that cause sin. Such things must come, but woe to the one through whom they come. Jesus is saying it will be worse for a scandalizer than for somebody drowned with a millstone. He's not mincing words there. That's how seriously he takes it but he doesn't uproot the weeds yet. Likewise, in the Sermon of the Mount, he says, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. The least in Jesus' categories are the scandalizers. 
and the hypocrites. But he permits them. Why? Because one of the most important lessons in the church, even though Jesus shares hatred for hypocrisy, for duplicity and scandal, he permits it because he hopes for conversion, just like the conversion of the good thief on the cross. Because his hope is that every sinner, every scandalizer might become a saint. We see this truth proclaimed in the prophet Ezekiel. God told us through him, but if the wicked man turns away from all the sins he's committed, if he keeps my statutes and does what is just and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of the crimes he's committed shall be remembered against him. He shall live because of the justice he's shown. Do I find pleasure in the death of the wicked? Do I not rejoice when they turn from their evil way and live? God is patient. He wants scandalizers. He wants hypocrites to turn around. Because sometimes the greatest witnesses are hypocrites turned holy men and women. What do we need to do in response to the reality of scandal and hypocrisy in the church? I'm going to highlight several things. First, we need to recognize the grace of hatred for scandals and hypocrisy. It's good that we are sick to our stomach when we see them. It's right that we're filled with righteous indignation, both the sins and the crimes of the clergy sex abuse scandal, or about politicians who sell out their faith for votes, or of husbands who betray their families and all other evils. But what does this vituperation show? How should we respond? In this, I've got an image on the left of the scene of Emmaus, which teaches us something very important. Remember what happened in that scene, which we can find in Luke 24. After the crucifixion, two disciples of Jesus are heading away from Jerusalem into the darkness. Jerusalem symbolizes the temple. It symbolizes God's holy mountain. It symbolizes where the covenants are lived out. And to walk away from Jerusalem into the night means you're turning your back on what God wants. Why were they doing it? Because they had placed their hopes in Jesus, this carpenter from Nazareth is the Messiah. And they had believed that the Messiah would kick out the Romans and not be crucified by the Romans. That it would purify the faith of the Jews rather than have it turn on him. So they were crestfallen and walking away. Jesus appeared to them as an anonymous wayfarer in his resurrected body. He didn't appear the same. It was mysterious. And he asked them what they're talking about as they journeyed along the way. And they told him that they had placed their hopes in Jesus of Nazareth, a man mighty in power and word, but how they were crestfallen when he was crucified. But then women came on the third day and they said he had been raised from the dead and they didn't know what to believe. And so Jesus upbraided them gently. And he said, how slow of heart you are to believe all that the prophets foretold. Not slow of mind, but slow of heart, because it was their will, their emotions were hurt. They didn't want to believe those women who had come. They didn't want to believe in what Jesus had already said. So starting with Moses and the prophets, St. Luke tells us, Jesus revealed to them how many times God had foretold that the Messiah would have to suffer and on the third day rise. And as soon as he started to do this, they began to recognize that the crucifixion wasn't a contradiction of the messianic prophecies, but a confirmation. And their hearts that were hardened before began to burn. So when Jesus stopped in their home at the end of those seven miles of journeying together and revealed himself in the breaking of the bread, their lives were totally turned right side up. And even though they had walked seven miles downhill into darkness at a time without flashlights, at a time without street lights, they ran seven miles uphill in pitch blackness to be able to share that great news with the other disciples. What's the lesson there? Pope Francis mentioned it in Brazil in July of 2013 at the end of World Youth Day. He said that Emmaus teaches us that the reasons why people leave Jerusalem, leave God, leave the faith, often contain the seeds of their return. That these disciples were leaving because they thought the crucifixion invalidated everything Jesus claimed to be. But when they discovered 
that Jesus had to suffer and rise, that's when they came back living the faith even more deeply. And that's a great lesson for everybody who takes candle. For example, if a 16-year-old girl is praying at the bedside of her grandmother in the hospital, just asking God to save her life, and then the grandmother's monitor flatlines, girls in this circumstance can begin to think that God must be cruel, or that prayer doesn't work, or that the faith is a crock. But when someone's able to chat with them and just say, you wanted your grandmother to live for, didn't you? Yes. Well, so does God. But if you, your prayer had been answered, she would have just come back into this world and eventually died again, maybe with greater suffering. God wanted her to have life and have it to the full. And that comes only when we pass through this life into eternity with God. Your grandmother was a woman of faith. We have every reason to hope that the Lord who died for her has now brought her to the Father's house and you will see her again. And that right now she's so much happier than anybody can be made on earth. This is an opportunity to flip a scandal right side up. Likewise, if somebody has abandoned the church because of the clergy sex abuse scandals, when they meet a priest who's genuinely holy, who sacrificed for them, who dies for them, that's when they can begin to believe in Christ working through the church again. Or if somebody's betrayed or abandoned the faith because they think that the church is homophobic with regard to her teachings on those with same-sex attractions, when someone is able to show that they actually love their gay and lesbian brothers and sisters more because they're loving them with the truth, and particularly when a priest or a religious appeals to them and says that they're being called to live not a loveless life, but a life full of Christ-like agape, a life full of the love of friendship we call philia, a, love full of stor a life full of storge, that affection we have for our friends, for those who are near and dear to us. They can begin to recognize that it's not the sexual revolution that's going to set them free but the truth. And that's when they can become the greatest of saints. We have to challenge them in this way to confront that scandal right on and show that what they think is being communicated is exactly the opposite. Next thing that we have to grasp in response to scandals is that hypocrisy isn't a mark of the church, but it's a mark of human beings. Well, the church can and should be held to a higher standard than other institutions, Christians to a higher standard than other persons. We shouldn't be a hypocrite ourselves in holding only the church to a standard that's high and other institutions or persons to very low or no standards at all. I remember once a student came to me when I was a high school chaplain. He came right into my office and his first words were, all Catholics are just a bunch of hypocrites. So I invited him to have a seat in front of my desk and I said, can you tell me what happened? And he said, I went and he named the guidance counselor and asked to switch my math class because he thought his math teacher was too challenging and he couldn't handle it. And this guidance counselor wanted him to stick it out in that class. And he said, you profess that you love people, you profess that you care, but when I asked for this, she just said no. So I listened to him. I said, can I ask you a question? He said, all right. I said, if you were across the street at the big public high school, which had 4,500 kids, and I said, you went to switch a math, math class to one of the guidance counselors there, and he said no, for the same reasons, because he wanted you to be challenged in math, would you go to the local CVS? Would you go to the local bank of Fall River and say, all Fall River people are hypocrites? He started to laugh, and he said, no, I wouldn't. They said, but you do that with Catholics. Why? He said, well, maybe I shouldn't because I recognize now that this guidance counselor isn't acting for the Pope necessarily. I said, fair enough, but why would you treat the church as if there's some type of greater bond? Why would you even jump to the conclusion that all Catholics are somehow implicated in one's actions? It was a mystery I wanted the person to explore. It's a mystery we're going to cover when we pray at the end of this conversation. 
Third thing I want to stress in response to scandals is that we can't forget the parable of the plank and the speck or the scene with the woman caught in adultery. Remember Jesus' words, and you can see an illustration of this on the left. Why do you notice the splinter in your brother's eye, but don't perceive the wooden beam in your own? How can you say to your brother, let me remove that splinter from your eye, while the wooden beam is still in yours? You hypocrite, remove the wooden beam from your eye first, then you will see clearly to remove the splinter from your brother's eye. So often, Jesus points to a psychological principle here, that we notice the same sins in others that we ourselves are prone to. That's one of the reasons why we're sensitive to them. We can notice them. Jesus doesn't want us to fail to give a fraternal correction to a brother who's sinning, but he wants us to be able to do it with charity. For that reason, we have to admit that we're sinners too, and from a position of lowliness go to our brother, rather than come from a position of condescension. Another scene that illustrates a similar lesson happened in John 8, in the woman caught in adultery. Remember the famous scene. These Pharisees dragged a woman caught in the very act of adultery before Jesus, saying Moses permitted them to stone people to death who were caught in flagrante. And they asked Jesus what they should do. If he said they were permitted to stone her, they thought he'd lose the respect of the crowds who thought that he was a friend of sinners. And if he said, don't stone her, he would be able to be treated as someone who didn't obey the Mosaic law. But Jesus transcended the question. And as we see, he said, let the one among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. In response, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders, because they likewise were all sinners. They needed to remove the planks from their eyes and the stones from their hands first. Otherwise, those stones would become boomerangs and come back to hit them squarely between the eye. The takeaway is that we're all called to live with integrity. Just like we can occasionally fill, fail to live in accordance with what we believe and the principles we profess, so can others. That doesn't make their failures right or easily dismissible, but it does prevent our becoming hypocrites and responding more to others' sins than reforming our own. Fourth thing I want to describe in response to scandal is that we should judge the church and other institutions, not by those who fail to live by its teaching, but by those who do. The church is more characterized by the 11 apostles who proved faithful than by Judas. The church is more defined by Teresa of Calcutta, as we see on the left, than Theodore McCarrick. The saints are the truest face of the church. This leads to a special summons for sanctity. If, as we read at the beginning of this presentation, the Second Vatican Council said that believers can have more than a little to do with the birth of atheism to the extent that we neglect our own training in the faith or teach erroneous doctrine or are deficient in our religious, moral, or social life and thereby conceal rather than reveal the authentic face of God and religion, then we can likewise have more than a little to do with the birth of faith through setting true good example. We can help bring people back. If only we, like Teresa of Calcutta, like so many ordinary saints next door, as Pope Francis calls us, those who really live quiet, holy lives, have brought so many to recognize what the faith really is. For every bad priest, there are so many good priests who have built up strong parishes. We need to find them. We need to give God thanks for them. And we need to allow their construction project to be a joint one with us in that construction crew. For believers, we need to remember that the church contains a treasure in earth and vessels. We can't so much focus on the frailty of the packaging, of the vase, that we fail to remember the treasure that's within, the treasure that God has entrusted. And so we finish with a prayer. And this prayer talks about one of the reasons why God allows people to continue to scandalize others, not because he wants the scandal, but because he wants the conversion. And over the left, you might recognize the scene. So the conversion of Saul into Paul. And we're going to pray through his intercession now for all those in certain situations who have been scandalized or driven away from the church, that all of us might be reasons for their return. Heavenly Father, 
We thank you for the gift of your fidelity to us and beg your help so that we and others may always be faithful to you in good times and bad all the days of our life. Help us to love and live in the truth that sets us free. Let your holiness shine in your sons and daughters so that others in seeing their good deeds may glorify you. Give your blessing in a special way to those who have been scandalized by members of your church, the church your son founded, those who have been hurt, those who have been turned away, just like your son met the scandalized disciples on the road to Emmaus and made their hearts burn. So help the members of the church enter into the conversations, lives, and questions of those who are heading away from Jerusalem, such a way that they might find that the reasons for their departure contain the seeds of their return. We make this prayer in a special way through the intercession of St. Paul. He was scandalized by the claims that Jesus, whom he believed to be merely a carpenter from Nazareth, was actually a divine son. But when Jesus revealed himself to him outside the gates of Damascus as he was persecuting the church, Paul ceased to be scandalized and began to be one of your son's greatest disciples and apostles. Please send your son to work similar moral miracles and all those when opposing the church are accidentally opposing Jesus and the mercy, salvation, and holiness that you offer them through him. We ask this in your son's name, who is Lord forever and ever. Amen. And you remember what Jesus said to Saul outside those gates in Damascus. He didn't say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my church? Why are you persecuting my believers? my faithful, my disciples, my sons and daughters. He said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Because Jesus so identifies with his church that anything done to his mystical body on earth is done to him. And that's why we're called to love the church just as Christ loved the church and laid down his life to make her holy. We are called to be Christ's instruments, to make that church holy. And that's the way that the scandals and the hypocrisy stop. For slides of this talk, please feel free to go to catholicpreaching.com and click on that right column on recent talks. There's likewise lots of other talks and homilies and articles there that might help you to respond to some of the modern questions, particularly this question that come from the scandal given by those not living the faith. I finish by thanking you for attending this difficult presentation when we confronted the reality of those who give scandal. Some of us may likewise have given scandal. God's mercy is there for us and he wants to strengthen us like he strengthened Paul to do far more good than we've ever done evil. And we pray in a special way not just for those who have been harmed by scandal, but for the scandalizers, that they might recognize their sins and repent and come to get to know Jesus so that they might kiss him, not as Judas, but as Mary used to kiss Jesus' cheeks, as Joseph did, and as so many of the believers with the love that Jesus desires and deserves. God bless you all.